So designing a microservices architecture, right? Uh, I'm not going to talk about I'm not going to talk about how to do that in any great detail. This isn't about how to design microservice architecture. Uh, it turned out that this talk became more about what that means. What does it mean to design a microservices architecture? Uh, and if you've ever listened to one of my talks before, you know I'm more of a, uh, a questioner. I don't actually know much, but uh, I have lots of questions. So what I'm going to do is we'll explore four concepts. And what we might find is as we go through these concepts, first of all, we're going to see some recurring themes, things that you've, you've heard us start to touch on today. And then hopefully by the end, we'll see how maybe all of this can come together. So out of curiosity, is anyone an expert in, in any of these four fields in the room? Would you consider yourself an expert? OK. So no one to be worried about. Uh, then let's start with this idea of design. Um, my, my title in the academy is actually, what is it now, director of design? Something we invented. The, the reason that I chose that is because I spent about two and a half years really trying to understand what design is. Uh, I probably have the same background as you. Lots of middleware, lots of enterprise experience, lots of uh, web-based integration experience. But there was this whole other space where people were doing design work. And what I wanted to do was find out if there are some pieces of gold there that we could somehow apply to our space. Uh, the first question that I hit immediately was, was this one. Um, what, what does it mean to have good design? Like pretty early, we kind of got to the point where we, we agree that good design seems to be important, right? This is something I assume we strive for in this room, right? We don't want to create badly designed things, poorly designed things. But I mean, really, which of these chairs is well-designed? Which one is designed the best? Uh, it turns out that it's really, it really depends on what you consider design to be, right? Is the chair that you're sitting on well-designed? Just out of curiosity, I hate that chair, right? Well, now, why, why do you, you said no and smiled. Why do you dislike this chair? Can we, can we do something about this chair? Is there? No. No. Okay. Well, so that's, that's, that's a, a design factor where it's not supporting your weight, right? So the chair itself has to be designed to, to fit, uh, to carry our load, right? To be comfortable. Um, but not all of these chairs are like that. So I, I don't know. I can't imagine what it's like to sit in this one, but someone might consider that to be good design. So this, this idea of what good design is could be different. It turns out that these kinds of ideas have actually been explored a long time ago. So this is uh, something from Marcus Vitruvius Polio. Vitruvius was an architect in the Roman era. And what Vitruvius did was he came up with a, a book called De Architectura, where he described some architectural principles for building Roman buildings. Uh, you might know Vitruvius from the Vitruvian Man. Right? You might have heard of that, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, based on his principles. But this is the principle I like. When describing how to build a building, it should be firmitas, utilitas, venustas. The building, the way we design it, should support the weight of the people who live in it. Right? This is the basic idea. But also, it should fit the way it's used. So when I come in, the hallway should lead me in. Uh, the rooms that make sense for when I, when I first enter the building should be present in this corridor. Maybe the rooms that are used less or more private are, are located somewhere else. But most telling is this last principle, or venustus, beauty, to make it beautiful. Uh, it's an early indication of this idea that design is not just about, does the door handle tell me if I should push or pull? But design is also about some kind of connection to people that transcends the, the physical object itself, right? some kind of emotional connection. So it's a good view into design. We have modern versions of this explanation as well. Here's a Peter Morville's UX honeycomb you might be familiar with. Right? I like Morville's honeycomb because at the, in the, in the, right in the center, he puts value. And when Morville describes value, he means value to the sponsor, to the person who's asking us to build this. Right? So value has to be ever present. Usefulness is this idea of function. Right. And from there, we have these other traits, usability, findability, et cetera, all the way to this, again, emotional idea of 
desirability. I don't know how much of this we take to heart when we talk about designing microservices. Uh, when we talk about designing microservices, often the conversation turns to how to use Docker, right, or what the size of a team should be. So there's something here, right? There's probably more we could explore. Uh, at least at the most basic level, we do know when people talk about design and, and microservices, they end up talking about complexity uh, because this is something that we seem to want generally with design, right? Simple is better. Uh, we have a lot of examples of that. The story is that Google is popular because they offer us a simpler interface. Right before Google, we used Yahoo for search, uh, and Yahoo was busy. Right? There was all kinds of things you could do. But Google wins because they offer a simpler interface. These kinds of products win because they are cleaner and simpler. So what we end up doing is striving for the simpler things. Right? This seems to be a, almost a principle of design. And in a lot of ways, it underpins a lot of the uh, conversation you hear around microservices, making things smaller, making them simpler, making them cleaner. It's attractive. Uh, to understand simple, we have to understand this other thing. Right? This is probably a good representation of complexity. We've heard the word complexity a lot today, right? Uh, but what is complexity then? What do we mean? We kind of say this word the same way we say things like API or really any of the words we've been using today lack formal definitions, microservices. Complexity is another one of those things. So there's a, there's a dictionary definition. But when I see this word, here's what I think about, right? Lots of things, lots of parts. Uh, something's not complex if it's like one unit. We don't usually say that's complex. The parts usually also are connected somehow. So the idea is something might be complex if I, if I touch it here and something might happen to the other pieces in there, right? We might perceive that as complex. But maybe one of the more common usages of complexity is the idea of processing. Uh, Computer science views complexity this way, right? Uh, algorithms that are complex might be the ones that are difficult for a computer to process. Um, we actually view complexity this way with our, with our brains as resources as well, right? So if we think of interfaces, interfaces are considered complex when it takes us a lot of energy to understand what's happening, right? It's kind of a, a measurement of processing. Turns out this is a very well-researched area, interface complexity. There's even two books on it, and these are on your reading list, I believe. Is anyone familiar with Don Norman? Not too many, okay, and probably less are familiar with John Maida. Uh, if you enter into the mainstream design space at all, if you look at any of the material that UX people read, uh, this guy's name will definitely show up. Don Norman is kind of this godfather of how interactions should be designed, of a kind of a psychology of things, right? He had a book called The Design of Everyday Things that's uh, massively popular. But here are two books that are specifically about interface complexity. They seem to come from very different viewpoints. So Maida's book called The Laws of Simplicity focuses on that model of simple. And Norman actually starts from the other side, living with complexity. Now here's what's interesting, different perspectives. They actually have very different writing styles, right? Slightly similar backgrounds. But they end up at roughly the same place, right? Similar conclusions. One of the big takeaways from Norman's book is that complexity is not the enemy, right? So in our strive for uh, simple, we seem to have the idea that complexity itself is bad. And Norman is saying that's not the case. What's bad is confusion. Uh, another version of this you sometimes hear is, uh, it's not about complexity, it's about complicated, right? It's the same kind of idea. But confusion has a particular connotation. Confusion is something you perceive, right? So keep that in mind. Maida's book is in a completely different style. He has these 10 laws and it's very almost Zen-like, right? Follow these laws, you find a path to simplicity. And he gives us the final law, the one. Simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. That somehow we have this 
thing we can grasp, and if we get rid of the, the bad parts and only keep the things that matter, that's how we get to simplicity. Both of these things become important, and we'll see why very soon. But simple question here. Uh, which of these things, then, is simple or complex? Which steering wheel is confusing? Right. How do we gauge that? Are these poorly designed, well designed? I mean, it really depends, right? Uh, hopefully, you know what kind of steering wheel this is, right? Formula One steering wheel. And on the left is some kind of Mercedes. Now, for a race car driver, this is not a confusing steering wheel. For you and I, it might be. But even if we look at this, the interface of it, you can see that there's design here. Look at the way things are grouped together, different colors. The location of the buttons are, are positioned for usability, right? Perfectly positioned. There's a lot of design that goes into it. What it shows us is that things like confusion are really perceived qualities and they depend on who's using them, right? So we can't talk about complex interfaces unless we talk about the people who are using the interfaces. Exactly. Right? It's true. So the same interface might be viewed as either simple or confusing. OK, so how do we make interfaces simpler, then, if this is the goal, whether those are APIs or other kinds of interfaces? It turns out then our job is not to provide things that are simple. It's to manage the complexity that's there. Complexity, it turns out, is always there. So we can improve learnability. We can make it so that these interfaces are easier for someone to understand. Uh, we can improve usability so that they fit better, right? The positions of buttons, groupings, colors. Uh, Ultimately, right, the goal, your goal as a designer, isn't to reduce complexity, it's to reduce confusion. Okay, so where does the complexity come from in the first place? Then? As far as we can tell, complexity is the price we pay, and it's the price we pay for function, for utility, right? So here's a mouse that is probably less confusing than this mouse, except I don't want to use that mouse, right? because it only gives me one button and not very much utility. So to get all these additional buttons, I end up using a mouse that's arguably more complex. There's more here. I would actu actually learn how some of these bits work here. Whereas this already has that single affordance that's easy to understand. Here's another version of that. Right? This, is, this is lauded as a simple, lovely design. But the reality is, I can only do so many things with this. But maybe for my media system at home, I need this functionality, which my parents are very afraid of, right? Because this is certainly a much more complex interface. You heard about Fred Brooks earlier. Mike talked about his book, right, The Mythical Man Month. Uh, Brooks actually wrote an essay that he included in later versions of that book in the beginning. And he wrote about complexity. So he has a paper called Essence and Accidents in Software Engineering. Here's what Brooks finds, that when you write software, you introduce complexity. Why? Because you're adding functionality. He also finds that just as Meta describes, you know, pull away the needless, keep the meaningful, he describes the same thing in these terms, essential and accidental complexity. Here's the idea. If you remove the essential complexity, you lose the spirit of what you were making in the first place. You lose that utility. You lose the soul of that code. But it's the accidental complexity that somehow we want to identify and get rid of. Another version of this I like is Larry Tesler's Law of the Conservation of Complexity. Uh, Tesla worked at Xerox PARC, uh, responsible for building a, a lot of the systems that were coming out of there. And he wanted to sell the management team on a library for UI that would be an abstraction layer. This is introducing a new component, right? To help them understand what the value of something like this would be, he described this law. Every application has an inherent amount of irreducible complexity, which sounds familiar. The only question is who will have to deal with it. The genius of the law is the use of the word who. It's not about where the complexity goes. It's about who pays the price. Who has that perceived confusion? So. I offer you this. Who is familiar with OAuth 2 in this room? 
few of you, right. Uh, raise your hand if you believe OAuth 2 is a complex specification. Yeah, and the rest of you are probably lying, right? Or you don't want to <laughs> raise your hand. Like, look, we know this is complex, right? Or to use the better word, confusing. I know because I read it. Uh, I thought I knew things. But man, right, there's a lot going on. Here's the other thing I know. If you build an API today, I'm going to recommend you use OAuth 2. How do those things fit together? Right? How can on one hand I say, here is a complex, confusing specification. And on the other hand I say, and you should use it. Well, if we take this complexity, and if we could somehow measure it, like really quantify it, and if I could take it and pour it into a cup. Remember I said Tesla has this law of the conservation of complexity. We know in OAuth there's two implementations generally. Someone's writing the client code, someone's writing the server code. So I ask you, who's paying that price, right? What we know is that it's the server implementer who pays the complexity price in OAuth 2. It's actually, I'm not gonna say it's trivial, but you're making a few HTTP calls over here and you include an authorization header. This I don't even remember, to be honest. There's a lot. This works because we actually favor the client in API interactions. We want them to have a better experience. So in this case, we pay the price. Further to this, though, OAuth 2 is a security specification. If this is confusing, that's not a great situation to be in. Which is why generally what you see is less of kind of build your own, and instead we have tooling, so now vendors are paying the price. Right? And this is the basic idea. So we manage the complexity away. We decide not to design and implement this piece. We offload it. We buy it. We get someone else to do it. So how about I talk about microservices? Right. We know that we want to do this and get to this. Right. That's basically the idea here, as far as I understand. The question is, who pays the complexity price? In this world, the world of the monolith application, who pays the price? The theory seems to be that code maintainers pay a really heavy price, right? And this seems to bear true. So if I change one part of this application, it could have an impact on interconnected pieces and libraries. I actually am always not sure what I'll do. If I change this, what are the dependencies here and all the interconnected parts? And there's so much going on. For the system maintainer, the person who has to deploy it, understand what's happening, there's only a small price to pay. It's a single unit. And as we said earlier, you know, when there's only one or two of something, it's generally not very complex. Okay, but of course, who pays the complexity price here? Right, we know that it swings. And as Tesla taught us, I'm not removing any function, right? The complexity that was there is still there. I haven't made the world simpler. All I've done is shifted who's paying. And it's essentially the same idea as OAuth. We're, we're at a point, it feels like, where we would rather have system maintainers pay this price than code maintainers. It's an acceptable trade-off, and I like it. And part of the reason that microservices can work in general is because we're introducing lots of tools to further manage that complexity. Right, so now we're going to shift it even further away. So the system maintainer pays a price, but we're hoping vendors and other developers will give us tools that further manage and hide that complexity away. But you need to make sure you understand that this complexity exists and that someone pays the price, right? If we expand this picture further and we imagine we have some boundary around our system and I introduce a client app that someone else builds, we've introduced a, a, a new victim of complexity. Right? Now we have a client app developer who may have to pay that price, who may become confused by what's happening, right? Yet another person paying the, the, the cost of complexity. So the patterns that were evolving around this, right, with either SDKs or API gateways or composers or whatever you want to call it, they manage it, they hide it, but they don't remove it because now this team pays the price. Okay? So just keep that in mind, the Tesla law of conservation of complexity. The other thing in terms of complexity that's, that are worth noting when it comes to microservices, um, there's often a lot of intra-service communication happening. As far as we can tell, 
a lot of the communication is, is starting to look tightly coupled, right? There might be a lot of uh, data typing or maybe you're using APIs that are difficult to change. The challenge here is that can actually introduce accidental complexity to the system. You're making parts that are interconnected more and more, that are harder to change, right? If we could come up with better solutions, ways of loosely coupling these services together, we can do what Brooks described and kind of chip away at some of that accidental complexity. Before we leave this, this topic of interface complexity, it's worth noting one, one last part of uh, Conway's paper that, I mean, that thing is so full of gold that Mike described four things that came out of it. Here's, here's a fifth piece. Uh, Conway actually describes complexity a little bit. He has about two or three sentences. Here's what he tells us. The world is complex, and organizations develop the way they do to manage that complexity. Right? Because a, a single unit in the organization may not be able to deal with all the confusion and complexity that it has to manage, so it starts to create children to dissipate that, which then influences the look of our system, which then becomes complexity we have to manage in the interface. So you can't escape the world. The world is complex, and that's where you are. There's a different kind of complexity I want to touch on now, and that's system complexity. So interface complexity is this thing about how hard is it for me to understand. System complexity is something else entirely. Right? System complexity is deep. Uh, here's two books. Melanie Mitchell's Complexity, A Guided Tour, and uh, the one I like is a bit more recent, and I just like the book, John Holland's Complexity, A Very Short Introduction. These will be on your reading list. If you get really excited about the complexity stuff, there's lots of stuff you can read. And there's so much I don't understand about it. But here's what I do. There's many, many definitions of system complexity, okay? Again, we don't have a finite definition, but the property that seems to come out the most is this idea of emergence. Uh, you've heard this phrase before, right? The, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, to be honest, I've heard that phrase many times. I never understood what it means, meant, sorry. Basically, what, what we're saying with this idea is that if I take individual birds and study their behavior, from that, I cannot infer what the behavior of the flock might look like alone. I need to kind of see it together. Um, Melanie Mitchell usually uses uh, army ants as an example. Right? We know a lot about ant colony behavior, but scientists still don't really get how it works when they're all together, how that works as a system, because the behavior is very different when you get a bunch of them together. So the idea of emergence is really important, uh, but it's also kind of a fuzzy idea. You can, you can claim something is emergent, but the real question is whether that's interesting. So Holland puts it this way, right? The motivation for treating a system as complex in the first place is to get at questions that would otherwise remain inaccessible. So to be a complex system, we have to find situations where there's emergence and where we can't understand the behavior unless we look at it as a system, at the interplay. Uh, there's also two kinds of complexity he talks about. One is the complex physical system, right? So here you have Lots of uh, laws, right? rules, static, static things that dictate how elements behave. And the only thing that changes, there's still emergence, there's interconnectedness, there's all those things, but the only thing that changes is their position. So the laws don't change. Uh, weather is used as an example of a complex physical system. The complex adaptive system, on the other hand, is one in which instead of having fixed rules, we have elements which are called agents that can actually adapt in response to what's happening, in response to their interactions. So Holland describes a whole kind of algorithm, almost an action life cycle here. Agents exhibit performance. Based on a trigger, they take action. A simple if-then almost rule. Agents score those actions. They decide, well, I just bought a stock. How well am I doing? Did the Stock go up, no, went down, I've lost money. And the most important part about this, the adaptive behavior, is that based on the scoring, agents may introduce new rules. They can actually discover new rules, new ways of operating. Right? What else can I try? This is exciting because if we got to the point of this kind of adaptive system, we can end up with decentralized behavior. The other thing that often happens is the agents themselves become more specialized. 
or smaller in their focus, right? They kind of evolve to solve specific types of problems. In a world where the behavior is decentralized, of course, the idea is that not only are the agents able to change, the whole system can start adapting to change. Uh, so the question is then, is a microservices architecture a complex system in the way that I've described? Is there complexity? Is the system complex? Uh, so we know on its own I can kind of predict the behavior of a microservice, right? I can send a request in through the API and get a response. Where it becomes interesting is if I put a few more of them in and we see how they start to interact, right? At the right scale, microservices architectures start to form networks as they serve requests, right? And we even start to see some patterns of uh, clustering and hubs, and this is classic complexity. Network behavior is an emergent behavior. For example, you know, load testing uh, microservices architectures might be difficult in isolation because we need to see how they interoperate together to get a sense of if the system could handle the load, right? How are requests fulfilled? It's difficult to say from a unit, but we could start to see how the system responds to requests. So we could say microservices could be complex physical systems. Right? There's no black or whites here, unfortunately. Now, are they complex systems in the adaptive sense? Well, we know that the services themselves are programmed to do things, and they generally don't change. Uh, I have yet to see microservices that actually evolve. We're not doing rule discovery. We're not doing any of that kind of adaptive behavior at the agent level. So we're not ending up with complex adaptive systems. Now, the reason we might want this, of course, is because in a world where each service is able to do these things, uh, perform, score itself, and, and discover new rules. Uh, we can end up with these qualities that we seem to care a lot about, right? Increased reliability, increased changeability. But the key is it's changeability at the system level, right? It's a whole other shift. How do you design a system versus how do you design an individual service? Uh, and Holland actually gives us some clues, right? One of the ways to design systems is to deal in patterns. Turns out complex systems almost always produce recurring patterns. What we need to do is not only use patterns to understand what's happening, but actually apply them. So to design a complex system, you introduce patterns to influence behavior. Holland actually goes so far as to describe it as having a grammar you come up with a list of these patterns, and you put them together in certain ways. Uh, effectively, it's, it's programming. Uh, we see a lot of examples of this, right? Uh, a great book, if you've not read it, you should, Christopher Alexander's The Timeless Way of Building. Uh, he has another book, a pattern language, which comes after this, where he describes exactly what I said. Each pattern represents our current best guess as to what arrangement will work to solve the problem presented. He's talking about city planning and building architecture but it's relevant to us as well. But we have this problem, right? It's interesting, but microservices are not adaptive systems. But there's a wrinkle here. Uh, I said services don't adapt, which is a little bit of a lie. They don't adapt in real time because they're deterministic. But they do adapt when we change them. You with me? There's an adaptive behavior that's built into here if we do this. If we say, the agent is not the service alone, but the agent is somehow the cyborg of the organization that builds the service as well. So we come back to this idea that organizations are important. Uh, really, the central tenet here is, is this. Here's a quote from Gareth Morgan, agriculturist. You might have heard this before. Farmers don't grow crops. They create the conditions for crops to grow. So somehow you have this goal of what the microservices architecture should be. Uh, but to get there, you're going to have to start laying all those foundations to get there, right? Uh, we mentioned Dee Hawk earlier, former CEO of Visa. He embraced all of this in the 70s. Went to the Santa Fe Institute of Complexity and understood what they did. He implemented patterns and constraints in Visa. Came up with this idea of chaotic systems, which are embracing the chaos, right? Embrace the complexity, but also add some governance. Try and find that balance. Uh, and he ended up ushering in this, this period of massive growth, decentralization, 
He bet on the system so much that once he put it in place to show that it was the system and not him that was responsible for the growth, he retired and hid and had nothing to do with Visa again and the growth continued. The system, the patterns he had put in place was the reason for the success, not him as the leader. That's true decentralization. That's embracing the system. So all of this kind of takes us to a place that I think is captured in something else that's happening in the design world, and that's service design. Uh, and when I say service design here, I, I probably don't mean the kind of service design you're thinking. Uh, service design is actually a discipline that's evolved from the UX world, right? So the, the UX people and product designers design products, but at a higher level than that, companies offer services to customers, right? So service design is really this combination of like the processes, the systems, when you put it all together, it's the designing of those things to deliver a service to people, to customers. There's a really good book if you want to get an introduction to what this space is. It's kind of a fuzzy space. I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit fluffy. But there's gold in here if we're willing to, to look into it a little bit. So Stick Dorn, who actually wrote this book, came up with these five principles. This is what service design is. Service design is user-centered, co-creative sequencing, evidencing, and holistic. We heard a lot about this idea of user-centric design, right? Even earlier today when Iraqli talked about product design, product management. We know understanding users and delivering products that fit their needs is important. One of the magical parts of service design is not only does it say this, we prioritize it, okay? In the entire system design. So this is our reason for design. Globally, prioritize the user and customer in the process. The other part of this is it's co-creative. We recognize that service delivery isn't about me making the mobile app for you to use, right? It's not just that flashy interface. There are customers involved, there are people or systems the customer interacts with, and then there's a host of people involved in the back to make it happen. Back office, backstage, however you want to phrase it. So we can get users and customers involved, right, in a participatory way, or we can have user testing, evaluation, we get a lot of that from the UX space. But the wrinkle here is that all stakeholders participate in the design. So we think about all of these groups of people when we design the system. Service design is sequencing. It means that we embrace time as an element. These aren't just experiences that we design in isolation, but we think about uh, the, the service design people call them moments. You might hear about user journeys, user stories, kind of the idea of the collective loop. How do people experience our, our product and service? And service design is evidencing because services tend to be intangible, right? Uh, the hotel we're all staying in, that's offering you a room as a service. There's an intangibility to the hospitality service, right? But there are things that can be given to you that are tangible as evidence of the service you're receiving, right? For example, if you're at the Delano, they're leaving these cards whenever they clean your room with quotes on them. That's evidence of a service process that might be invisible to you. And lastly, service design is holistic. We have to view the design in a wider context, right? Not just in terms of individual interactions, but in terms of sequencing, in terms of time, in terms of the people who build all this stuff. It's big. So here's a simple example, a very simplistic example of what service design might mean, right? In a coffee shop, we have touch points, of ordering and receiving coffees. We identify customers and we know that these experiences drive our design, but we also design this part. How do we make the front stage employee's job easier? What is the system that delivers inventory and how do we make coffee and how do we do all of this in a way that these experiences are optimized? These aren't separate things, right? These are all interdependent. It's all related. Uh, you'll often hear about empathy in service design or empathy in design in general, right? So we have one goal, provide high levels of customer experience. But there's a second goal in service design, which is the important one. And that's we provide high levels of employee experience as well. For the first time, we start to say that empathy is not just for the customers, but also for the people who build the stuff, who build the interface, who build the systems, who do all of that backstage work. With the understanding that 
this is all for the, the user in the end. So we empathize with all of the actors. So if I put this together in a microservices context, right? Instead of a service-oriented architecture, if we do like a service design-oriented architecture, we find that first there's this idea of customer experiences, right? So we do what we always have done. We start focusing on you know, those touch points, mobile apps and websites. But we also need to start thinking about platforms that enable this to happen, the API platforms, internal applications that you build for your branch staff. Right? Maybe underpinning that, we think about implementation. Right, the microservices network we're building, automating the processes, containerization, actually writing the code. And then maybe underpinning it all is this idea of organization. Kind of the stuff you heard Mike talking about, number of teams, size of teams, what are the patterns? Uh, if, I, if I view this, instead of a circle in a different way, more of like a, a hierarchical system, which is also an indication of complexity. Right, we've got the customer, the touch points drive what we do. Behind here, we're going to design a, a system of platforms. And what we see is there's organizations possibly for each of these things. Each of these things have owners, people to design and build them. And each of these are design tasks, right? Our microservices, which are represented by their interfaces, registries in them. Maybe inside the container, we actually have code and data store. So we end up with, overall, a massively complex system. So we start to pull this little thread of you know, designing microservices architecture, and you end up kind of here. Right? And this seems to be kind of the world that's evolving. So if the goal is designing a microservice architecture, we want to link all these things together. Here, here's what we can learn. The first thing is we have to respect this idea of complexity. You're going to hear it a lot. You'll say it a lot. But understand that. It's not the enemy, right? Don't be afraid of introducing complexity. Often when you're introducing complexity, you're introducing utility. It might be that the problem you're trying to solve is complex, so the solution may be complex as, all, as well. But what you strive to reduce is accidental complexity. What can you remove without impacting you know, the, the essence of the system you're providing? And probably most important, if the complexity is there, make sure the right people are playing, paying that price. Right? Who should be paying the complexity price in your organization, in your scenario? Uh, the second lesson is we need to design iteratively. Right? We've heard that a couple of times. And this is particularly important if we embrace the idea that what we're designing is a system. Because this is the only way to design a system. Designing iteratively means we identify maybe some behaviors and properties we want. And then we need to steer the system towards that, right, by introducing small changes. We want to learn uh, and evolve. And then finally, we have this idea of designing holistically. Right? Understand that what you're building is actually a system. Right? There's a systematic nature to this, this thing we're trying to, to grasp. But what we learn from service design right, is that the decisions we make, the plan we put together, should be user-centered. And we should be provider-centric in our design decisions. I think this is particularly important and might be missing in our discussions. When you get excited about microservices, when you think about the things you want to do, when you hear about Netflix and the amazing things they're doing, how often do you connect the dots there and think about what Netflix users need what the experiences that Netflix are providing and how that matches to the system they're creating, and whether that's a fit for what you're doing. Right? Recognize that there's massive complexity costs that someone will be paying as you move towards these you know, ideal goals of changeability. And decide whether it makes sense for you, because it may not. Netflix's architecture may not make sense for the customer experience you're building, right? which is what we mean by saying you need to start by being user-centric. And then the last thing, it turns out, when you're designing holistically, is that in a sense what you're going to be doing with a microservices architecture is programming the organization. It feels like that's what we're starting to do. We're starting to learn the patterns that Mike described. Understanding the constraints, right? Figuring out what these pieces are you can bend, and as you start to get better grammars, you'll start to actually change things. This may be your end goal. You might start by dabbling with containerization, 
But if you really want to go deep, you're going to end up having to do this. But the key is to do this with empathy, right? It's one thing to fiddle with some code. It's another thing to tell a, a system operator that you don't need them anymore, right? So this is dangerous territory. You need to preserve this idea of empathy all around for this to work. That's the world, at least as I see it. 